Thank you, Tibor, and uh, thank you, and uh, Sida, for this afternoon. I want to say good afternoon to everyone. It's about uh, half past. Yes, so, it is afternoon for some, evening for others, and morning yeah. for even other uh, other people in the audience. Yeah. yeah and uh, thanks so much for giving me this opportunity to to be able to share. Uh, I would call it a life uh, experience. Uh, I, I, I'm not so certain whether my screen is uh, visible. Uh, it is visible, though not yet in presentation mode. If you can uh, launch presentation mode uh, in slideshow, for instance. Ah. Yep. And uh, it's been such uh, an honor, I mean, uh, after quite, uh, quite some time to, to, to get back to, 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 to this, to be able to to be able to feature onto this and uh, uh, participate in this online seminar. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, we, we did stop seeing your sh your screen, Robert, for some uh, reason. Of course, the other thing here is that uh, uh, as opposed to the previous two presentations, I, it has been more of uh, uh, a technical presentation. What I'm, I'm sharing in the next 10 minutes is the is uh, more like experience sharing. Nice, very, very important. I think, is it in presentation mode? Uh, no, not yet, but yeah. if you, yeah, I guess perfect. So, so, so I, I'm talking about just about three, four points here, but, and uh, it's more like a story that has, that has developed within my country for the last, I could say a couple of, uh, Two, three, four years, and uh, an experience as a person that is involved in the in the water fraternity, and based on the fact that uh, my jurisdiction and job description requires me to look into such aspects, so I couldn't help but get caught up into this. Now, uh, for for this start, I would want to share, give you a little bit of the background, is that uh, my country is uh, hosting close to actually over one and a half million refugees. And this is statistic of early in the beginning of this year. And uh, we had a very big influx in the 2016. Uh, that's about five, six years back when <clears throat> we, there was a lot of in, in insecurity in the neighboring countries. And uh, I would say our brothers and sisters across the borders were forced to flee. And then it turns out that we have several locations across the country where these persons are hosted. The, it's also important to note that we don't have refugee camps in my country. We call them settlements because of the, camp, uh, the country's policy which is more of an open door policy. And then uh, we, we, we are looking at uh, uh, environments that have to make sure that these persons are feeling comfortable. So we have even adopted acts that uh, provide for, uh, for example, a refugee in my country is allowed to go and find work elsewhere for their sustainability. They also have access to basic social uh, services. And also the nationals are allowed, uh, uh, nationals are to allow for their dignified stay. Uh, until they feel safe to return. So that, that, that's something very unique about uh, our country. But again, again, in addition to this, I don't know if this map is clear. Sorry, it doesn't, but you can see that if you have an impression of how these persons are floated, it's mainly in the, in the northwest part of the country. And the area I'm talking about is this, if you could see my casa where we have this big population. Uh, we have what we call a comprehensive refugee response framework that has been developed and is hinged on five pillars. Uh, of course, when disaster happens, we have admission and rights, then we have the emergency response, and then we have resilience. So when these people are settled, we have to give them self-reliance, expanded solution. Then finally, which is also very important to note, we have a voluntary repatriation. So we have put acts in place that allow for the refugees to feel comfortable, one of them is called the hope strategy, that is the refugee and post-population empowerment. We have settlement agendas that are to look towards the transformation. And then we also ask the host to make sure that these persons are kept comfortable. I have put a little bit of the statistics to give you an insight into what we're going to talk about. Uh, we're talking about this settlement called BDBD, that's the name. It has got an area of 250 square kilometers with a population uh, as of January of 246,000, meaning that uh, basically is about 985. Now, the host district is called Yombe, and the, this, the population density is only 290. This is third. If you look at the national scale, it's about 
200 and some. So you can have an idea of how this is operated this place. Is. So I tried picking this from the Google satellite. And uh, if you look at these small dots, they are not actually dots, these are homestead. If we take a closer look when the camera is maybe about one kilometer off the ground surface, you can see the settlements, very many of these. And every dot you're seeing here is the household. Somebody is living there, maybe two, three, four persons are living in that place. So I have picked data uh, starting straight back from around 2017 that is trying to show what the supply of water has been over this period of time. For example, I want to draw attention to, we have a column here showing the demand of the water and what is supplied. And then I have tried to unpack what is supplied. Now, a while ago, we had most of this water being carried through trucks. And you can imagine this volume of water being carried in the truck every day. And then over time, uh, we have had zero water being trucked and most of the water coming from groundwater wells. So the story here is that uh, much as the water trucking contributed during the period where uh, people have just come into settle, we have tried to find solutions and the solutions are that groundwater has contributed to bringing down the water trucking. Of course, later on, I'm going to show you what it means in terms of cost. But groundwater has been very, very instrumental in, in solving and trying to meet the deficit. Of course, we still have a shortfall here in the demand and the supply. But at least to, uh, at this present level, we have persons at least having about 10 to 15 liters of water a day. The ideal number is about 15 to 20 liters per day. Now, the, the, the water supply situation, of course, traditionally in Africa, we use uh, hand pumps. Uh, but uh, other existing water sources, uh, maybe perennial and seasonal swamps and streams, and we agree with it and not safe. And then this is what we've been using, the deep pumps, the shallow wells, and a little bit of the protected springs in this place. And uh, this is a little bit of the tutorial of uh, what's that are going on there, having the sources in place. But I have to mention here that we as government have tried to come together with the United Nations Commission for refugees to make sure that we do a transition coming from uh, uh, the hand pump technology to what we are calling the pipe water technology, and you can see of these taps are coming up. And they, I think the the bigger part of the supply that you are seeing actually as of today includes about 43 pipe water systems, and then only 100 uh, hand pumps. And the hand pump uh, number has dropped from it was I think starting from around 400 to about 100 in this single place. Now. This is to me, I think, is the big story, or, uh, and that's why I feel that this is something that I remember the, the theme of, 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 of this uh, discussion, that we have had uh, intervention as a result of groundwater, the presence of groundwater, which I'm calling the invisible resource, that uh, at a national level, the aid agencies and affected persons have been able to benefit uh, from their settlement has been made much easier because groundwater has been a catalyst in this process. Now, because of our principles, uh, uh, the people living in these areas have also been able to uh, derive livelihood where they are involved in gated agriculture. We're using water groundwater as a source. Uh, they are doing other livelihood projects like water vending. Uh, I think, uh, Rafa, you are familiar with this, have uh, existed in most of these African environments. Uh, you know that water vending is a key source of income for so many people. So even within the refugees, because of the ability for us to be able to interact with them, the nationals and the refugees, Refugees are also vending water from within the settlement to outside the people, those who need the water. There are other uh, activities like maybe brick making or maybe putting up household houses. And then refugees themselves have also been trained to become a uh, form part of the team that does the operation and maintenance of some of these sources. So this is leading uh, a dream to some of these people and adding to their livelihood. And of course, the host communities have also benefited from, from the presence of this. Uh, most coast communities actually do not have a better supply of water, but you can see that uh, pipe water has been extended to their, uh, their places of uh, abode, and, uh, uh, and I think they have also redefined uh, the livelihood for the, the, the coast communities as well. Now, if you look at the, uh, a scale of uh, maybe if we're looking at the scope with respect to the Commission, the United Nations High Commission had a very big expenditure on, of course, overall, but uh, water also contributed to this. Between 2015, 16, and 17, when it was maximum. And then when our intervention came in, you can see that the graph has flattened until now, where I guess if we get the value for 21, it will even be going down. But what is the impact of this? I think 
by being able to take water tracking out of the equation, uh, groundwater has significantly contributed to uh, this uh, achievement. Of course, this cannot be achieved like the, like, like Sida was saying, the thread so to this. And uh, I see that if you remember the, 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 the photograph I shared, the aerial photo, all those households, it's mandatory that they develop some form of sanitation and the preferred form is the pit latrine, and this is what I'm trying to show. So each of those households has got a pit latrine, and these are now potential sources of contamination. How we are going to deal with that, that's now another case to talk about. And then also the other threat is that there has been a lot of wood that has been cut down to, uh, to provide fuel for cooking, and these also wetlands are being degraded. Of course, if it's changing the rainfall regimes, the intensity and the duration, then issues are coming with more runoff generated and less infiltration. Then you may find that in a short while we may run out of water within the ground. But I think now that is another case that we have to settle at a uh, at management level. I want to, to, to end my discussion with this slide that we're looking at. This is another key a threat. The development of some of the water sources has been done in, in I would call it an emergency way. And you can see in this photo there are two pumps that are quite close one to another. I guess you agree with me that operating this is going to interfere. But this could also be a question of extreme obstruction. And these are things that we're going to be addressing. Probably maybe we could have a lot of research coming to this area to help us find solutions to such challenges. Uh, for this uh, discussion, uh, I want to thank you for your attention. This one I wanted to hear. Thank you so much. Thank you, Robert. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Uh, also very nice to see this uh, really uh, practical case study. Uh, well, and uh, actually really uh, an, indic an overview of uh, how you're dealing with, how groundwater has its importance and how you're uh, dealing with the many challenges uh, that, uh, that, have, that have appeared. Um, and uh, I'm looking in the question and answer box at this moment, if there's a question linked to, to, to your presentation, not yet, it might be arriving. It, it links in a way also to Raphael's work on uh, the potential. And uh, I was actually, maybe I can ask a question on Raphael linked to Robert's work, to your work, Robert. In, in, in this, this huge amount of refugees arriving uh, um, and, 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 and needing of course to also to have a place to stay but also water resources was that was that also considered like in kampala that's a, a huge amount of uh, additional uh, inhabitants let's say that arrived yeah of course uh, i did mention that we have about 12 i mean 13 settlements and uh, we have what we are calling urban refugees now urban refugees are usually they can be part of the population so yes. we that the existing infrastructure should be sufficient to provide for their amenities or their requirements. So the, the, the system here requires that the urban refugees through the commission are uh, kind of like settled in some household somewhere, and then this household should have should have uh, services like maybe national grid, power, and then the water supply. So they become part of the, the exactly system supply. We don't need to do specialized supplies to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th thank you. There's another question coming in uh, from Abraham. Uh, what kind of role does the private sector have or did it play in the development of the groundwater sources uh, in, the, in these refugee settlements? Or was there a role for the private sector? Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, thanks, Abraham, for this question. Now, uh, much as, of course, within the 15 minutes, there's not a lot that can be said. But <laughs> I want to bring to the attention that... Uh, the implementation, the physical implementation of all the infrastructure being mentioned about is done by the private sector. So the, the commission and the ministry and whoever is concerned, the aid agencies as, uh, as the owner coming together to make plans and maybe find resources and then go out and outsource the, the private sector because uh, they are the experts in doing this. So we also have them involved, but it's more like in the infrastructure development. Yeah. Um, Robert, do you see, so there are studies out there, especially from the, from Richard Taylor and his group in the UK, that, that the increase in intensity uh, of rainfall can also, uh, in some places, enhance the groundwater recharge. And that is mostly through focal recharge, meaning there is flooding happening and, 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 the, and those waters 
can also recharge the aquifer system below. Uh, you also mentioned, of course, the issue of runoff of flooding. Is is that currently uh, a big issue in uh, in Kampala? The, so the floods themselves, and and do you see the also the potential benefit of that in terms of recharge of the aquifer? Yeah, of course. Uh, I mean, once there are floods, it's the first indicator there have been rain. So you expect that a fraction of those rain will definitely. I think the question here is the, how much contact the rain has with the ground so that you can have more infiltration and maybe percolation later on. Now, within the, within the settlements, I would wish that we shouldn't have any occasion of that because while it might seem like it's recharging, but it could also be carrying along with it the pollution because like I did show the, the, the various number of Latins there. Yes. And once we have floods within these places. Yes. It gets chaotic. First of all, it's also going to displace the people. Uh, the, the farms are going to be maybe distorted. Uh, it, 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 the situation of recharge here is a little bit complicated. Yeah. It's not like the way the area has been settled. The, the, the settlements are located. Yeah. Don't go to recharge areas are more in the upstream than the downstream of where the settlement is. And the, if we can have the rains in the upstream and they, they come down here through the ground, we are more comfortable. If it happens within the settlements, I think we might have immediate problems. There are occasions where we have uh, cholera outbreaks, just as a result of this heavy rain. But uh, uh, so, so for, for, for us as managers, we would wish that, yes, we have rainfall, but controlled and in amounts that we have to come up with that. That's the thing. Yes, I see, of course, that links to water quality. And also Magwa Nyambeka from the audience had a question on around uh, any solutions that you're considering to uh, to reduce or mitigate that, that the potential pollution by the many pit latrines that you mentioned, right? Especially if they're upstream of a borehole or a well or a spring, they can give the serious problems to, uh, to to these to these water sources. Yeah, exactly, Mark. I, I think he, what we had before in the in, in the onset, maybe about four years back, we were mainly focused in developing hand pump technology because these do not require a lot of input, but uh, we are operating in an emergency environment where people would want to have water immediately. You cannot tell someone wait till tomorrow. So uh, after we had developed the critical mass of hand pumps to carry us through at least to provide this emergency water supply, then we started looking at the, the future threats. And one of those was the contamination. So that's why I said earlier when we had over a network of over 400 hand pumps, that has now been reduced to close to 130. And then we had no pipe system, but now we have about 43 of those. So the location of the, the boreholes that are providing water of the pipe system has to be made strategically so that we can, we're not so vulnerable to contamination. We can't rule out the effects of groundwater movement when a blocking is ongoing, but at least we can try to avoid that. So we, we are avoiding water quality challenges tactically by phasing out the traditional hand pumps, which are close to within the settlement, and mm -hmm. then trying to go for the uh, the large pipe water system where mm -hmm. we can even afford to do some kind of treatment. Because it is, a, it is mandatory that whichever water supply system is developed at a national scale has got to have a chlorine dosing mm -hmm. component, irrespective of whether the quality of the water was good at the time of construction. So this also is our backup plan once we have cholera out just to increase the residual chlorine to make sure that a lot of uh, exactly. issues are managed. Yes, I guess centralizing these uh, these water sources also brings the advantage that you can protect them, uh, or you can have uh, like uh, you know uh, protection zones around them, uh, versus the households or the hand dug wells where that is more complicated. But they then have other advantages as well. 